Welcome to Destination Animation, your trip around the world of cartoons and anime, stop motion and puppetry, special effects and CGI, and everything in between. I am your host, Becca McGraw. And I'm your host, Carrie Drublo. And I'm your host, Jason Knott. And today we're talking about Cartoon Network's first miniseries released four years ago, Over the Garden Wall. Wow. Over uh, the Garden Wall. Yeah. Yes. Um... So we are continuing our spooky tober month with another spooky cartoon. Yes. Um, spooktober. Spooktober. Spook, or po- spooks. possibly a more clever animation related pun. I got nothing though. Yep. <laughs> Whatever. We'll just go with spoopy. Spoopy. So yeah, let's I don't know, let's just get right into it, guys. This is a mini series. What does that mean? It means it is a series that is small. Yes. It's only what, ten episodes? <laughs> Yes, 10 episodes, 10 minute, 10 episodes. So like about an hour and 40 minutes runtime. Yeah. And the whole thing aired, uh, they aired the episodes in pairs over the course of a week and four years ago, like you said. Was it the week of Halloween? No, it was the week after. Okay. Very fall vibe to this show, though. So it's like, yeah, you can watch it as Halloween. I like watching it every Halloween, but it, it just fits with the entire fall season vibe. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, definitely, because it does, to jump way ahead, it does, It ends with, like, winter, so it's a very nice, mellow, fall into winter kind of feeling to it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, um, what even is this show? It was created by Patrick McHale uh, for Cartoon Network. Uh, Pat McHale was a writer on Adventure Time, and... When we talk about modern cartoons, a lot of people like to talk about the storyboarders because they do, you know, a good chunk of the writing, too. But cartoons still do have writers. And uh, I think Pat McHale, I don't remember, though, if he actually left the show Adventure Time, that is, to work on Over the Garden Wall. But he was there, you know, early on. He's the one who provided the weird quote at the start of the Ocean of Fear episode. And he's the one, if I remember correctly, who Party Pat is based on. Yeah, he is. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, a lot of the good Cartoon Network stuff has its base in Adventure Time. That show like launched the careers of a lot of their good, mm-hmm. a lot of their good story people and animators, and like Steven Universe is from Adventure Time, and this is from yeah. Adventure Time, and Be and Puppycat, all sorts of things. Yes, and a lot of the Adventure Time alumni helped out in the show in some way. Cool, very cool. Yes, that's networking, kids. And it's a big thing in the animation industry. Yeah, you gotta make friends. Oh no, I'd be doomed. Yes. <laughs> so, we're not gonna get as in-depth on the plot as we usually do, I don't think. Um, so what this show is overall, it's about two brothers, uh, Wirt and Greg, who are wandering around in this place called The Unknown. It's this vast forest. Um, they don't know where they are, where they're going, they just want to go home. And, uh, what else happens? Well, they encounter a talking bluebird named Beatrice, who decides that she wants to take them to Adelaide of the Pasture, who can help them get home. To Adelaide, to Adelaide, they're going to the Adelaide Parade. This is a very musical show, so I'm going to be singing a lot. I apologize. (laughs) Yes. And this is a very episodic show, Mm -hmm. so in general, the way the plot works is that, like... Every episode, they're in a different location, and we kind of explore that different location, and then, you know, we kind of move on, and there is an overarching plot, but in some episodes, it's just kind of touched on, and then it doesn't really come to fruition until the very end, but it just slowly gives you more and more hints about what's going on in the unknown, and so, yeah, it's it's an episodic show that allows them to showcase a bunch of different styles, but it still gives you a very, like, nice plot and a payoff off at the end so yeah it's it's a very tight show uh the main overarching thing would be there in the first episode they encounter the woodsman who's carrying around this lantern and chopping down these trees apparently in service of some sort of beast beware the beast raw the beast yeah also voiced by christopher lloyd so marty you've got to come back with me back to the future <laughs> into the unknown yes. apparently. Oh, marty. <laughs> yeah who else is in this show Oh, we got a bunch of people. We got Elijah Wood as Wirt. Yeah, the, one of the main characters. Tim Curry as Auntie Whispers. Auntie Whispers. Oh, I have words to say about Auntie Whispers uh, a little bit later. <laughs> yes. You got John Cleese as uh, 
<laughs> Quincy Endicott, an eccentric old man, and also Adelaide of the Pesture, the good witch, yes. I think, almost, maybe. Mm, <laughs> yeah, I, I do feel like a lot of, like, this show isn't as well known as a lot of the other things that we've talked about, so probably we're not going to get into too spoilery detail because we just want people to watch this because it's really good. Yes. Absolutely. Take the time to watch this, please. Yeah, and it's like the same length as a movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you can watch it all, all the episodes. It has a DVD, no Blu-ray yet, but... With the DVD, you get, like, a commentary between Pat McHale and Nick Cross, who was the art director. Ooh. And, like, you also have a composer's cut, which is just, you know, all other audio and, like, you know, the sa- dialogue. dialogue is cut. And you just hear the great music done by the Blasting Company. Yeah, the music is excellent throughout the show. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think I think the composer's cut also keeps all the songs intact. Yeah, they do. Yeah. Like, some of them still have to be cut because, you know, long songs, short episodes, but... Like, most mm-hmm. of the songs are, are in their full and the composer's cut. Yeah. And a lot, like, one of the cool things about the music, this is a very old-timey show in terms of, like, the inspiration, the classic animations. Like, there's a lot of nods to old classic animation styles and illustration styles and even storytelling styles, and the music reflects that, too. Like, you get a lot of, like, old 20s jazz. You get a lot of, like, folk kind of music, and they actually played it on, like, period instruments using old recording equipment to make it sound very old-timey and classic. So just a lot of work on the music and it, it's excellent the show has such a vibe yeah they had they got a lot of uh like jazz singers and classically trained opera singers too like jack jones has a pretty good song number in the middle of the show and you got like shirley shirley jones as beatrice's mother singing a little lullaby at one point and also there's an opera singer who plays the beast samuel Ramey. yes who is just very good in <laughs> And this show, like, it's old-timey vibe. It's a dreamlike thing. I don't know if it's a mix of the nostalgia with the style. Even throughout the show, if you notice, if you look carefully, the edges um, have a slight blur to them all the time. Yeah, yeah. I noticed that when, like, not on the TV when I was first watching, like, you know, the episodes as they came out every day, but, like, I went back and bought the series on iTunes, which is the only time I've ever used iTunes, and, <laughs> like, I just noticed it on my own, like, you know, computer screen, like, oh, the edges are blurred, that's that's kind of neat. Yeah, it it's kind of like the memory fog that you would have in other cartoons, except it's there the entire time, but it's not super noticeable. No. Yeah, it's definitely, um, I didn't notice it. <laughs> yeah, it's a very, very subtle detail. Yeah, but... Also, like, expanding, like, even though it uses a lot of, like, old-time animation and cultural references, it is still very much, like, a modern show. And, like, it's the contrast. Like, in the very first episode, they establish, like, they have Wirt walking into the frame and waxing poetically about life and, like, what is this woods and life and oh me and you know like kind of in a robert frost kind of way and then we have greg who just comes in he's like you know candy trail for my pants and (laughs) we're here to burgle your turts uh we gotta talk about the symbolism and stuff so a really popular interpretation of this show is that it's kind of based on Dante's Inferno? Am I interpreting that interpretation right? Yeah, yeah, Dante's Inferno. Or it's an interpretation of Limbo. Limbo, Dante's Inferno. Yeah, Yeah, people have definitely talked about that. Yeah, and I dig it. I kind of agree with the Limbo. I don't know. I don't know about the Inferno, but Limbo I will agree with. Mm -hmm. Like, I haven't even read the Divine Comedies. There's like three parts of that, right? Limbo, Hell, and Heaven, or am I wrong? That sounds right. Everyone knows the Hell part, but the other two are just like, eh, they're there. (laughs) Yeah, that, not as marketable and sexy as hell. Oh, yeah, totally. <laughs> but, like, yeah, the Beatrice character leading the, you know, main characters, that's taken from the Divine Comedy. And things like paying two pennies to cross the river or something, I think, comes from that as well. Yeah, that's also, like, you know, river stick stuff. Yeah, in the very first episode, um, this character, the woodsman that they meet, talks about the beast and how the beast is the loss of hope. And then later in the show... Um, like we do possibly get connections that this might be like a limbo and them trying to get home is like almost like they're wandering in like purgatory or the afterlife sort of in like this like in between state between life and death and they're so it's kind of like a battle between will they go back to life and yeah i don't want to get too spoilery but that's how i that's how i read it 
Yeah. Uh, another interesting interpretation I just remembered, kind of tying to Dante's Inferno, is there's these um, there's these mysterious trees throughout the show, which I won't get into it exactly, but I believe part of Adelwood. you know Dante's Inferno. Yeah, the Adelwood. Um, yeah, this is a. I'm <laughs> just gonna kind of give it away just from saying it, but I believe in Dante's Inferno. Uh, one of the circles of hell is um, you know, suicides become trees. Oh yeah. Huh. Yeah, that's that's a thing. I won't say much more about it, but it's something to keep in mind while watching it. One, I've never actually read Dante's Inferno. I just like know of it from pop culture and that video game yeah. that was made like years ago <laughs> that no one remembers. Yeah, I'm a bad English major. I don't know the Inferno, <laughs> <laughs> and I took religion for crying out loud. Uh, I'm I'm wow. so bad. Oh, oh criminy. Oh, criminy. I read the Wikipedia article once. <laughs> Wikipedia is good. Wikipedia is wise. Yes. <laughs> Wikipedia is wise and all-knowing and not... And not just edited by amateurs who... Yes. <laughs> How about those songs, though? <laughs> How about those songs? Like, you got... the the. There's so many, like, great freaking musical cues from old cartoons and jazz and... I really love the opening theme song. It's very evocative and mysterious and yeah for sure you know exactly what you're getting into when you see this yeah and even like the first and last episode is the only time you hear that but like you know from two from two to nine it's bookends you get that like you know musical cue from it and you hear like a a train whistle in the background it's like ooh, ooh it's mysterious it's it's ominous it's great yeah yeah and the opening um it does hint to something you're going to catch on a rewatch listeners is that it does hint about like all the little plot points that they're going to hit all throughout. So pay attention to that opening. Pay attention. Yeah. It starts with kind of like a visual summary of what you can expect, and then it bookends it with kind of like um, revisiting all of those places. And Yeah. So, yeah. It's very cool. It is kind of like a poem where it starts and ends with a similar stanza to bookend it, and then there's all of these like separate verses. Ah, very, very well said. That's very true. That's fitting. I like that. Yeah. yeah, and again, like, Wirt constantly is, like, going on these, like, poetic verses waxing on about the meaning of life and what is, yeah, and... He's such a dork. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he is a total dork. It's, like, the great contrast between him and Greg that make them, you know, compelling characters and believable brothers. Yeah, either one could almost be annoying on their own. Yeah, but... But they balance each other perfectly. Yeah, together they're great. Yeah, they work off each other very well. You know, the difference between, like, cynicism and optimism, like... Yeah. Extreme pessimism, extreme optimism, like, they both have kind of their faults, and, like, they do balance each other out. Yeah. Uh, just to stay on the thread of music, though, just so we're not all over the place, yes. um, what's the next song? Patient is the Night? Oh, yeah. Patient is the Night. Chris Isaac is, a. Uh, rock and roll kind of music guy from the 70s 80s but like he did a really good kind of folk song for this song for this show mm -hmm. oh is this the pumpkin harvest song yeah that's this is enoch yeah it's uh just during this kind of montage of work and greg greg it's and beatrice <laughs> all working the fields uh, i love the image it ends on which is just this it's it's nothing it's just this embellishing image of this pumpkin man you know standing overlooking the fields little breeze on his scarf yeah little touches animation is really hard you guys so when when they do stuff like this that's just for the mood yeah like even the ep ending for episode two has that like leaf that gets stuck on the fence and it's like that doesn't really mean anything it's not like an ominous statement it's just there for you know this is autumn it it, it looks nice yeah. Well, also in the commentary, they talked about how um, they deliberately put in these little embellishing shots where they can be read two ways. You can either look at it as kind of like a visual metaphor and be like, what does it mean? Or you can just look at it and like, wow, that's pretty. That's a nice postcard. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes. And yeah. yeah, they even said in the commentary, too, that, you know, knowing that they only had 10 episodes and they had a very, you know, short production schedule, like... It allowed them to go a little more, you know, out there with the visuals than they would have if this was a whole series. Hmm. Yeah. Enough. They say the network let us do a bunch of that, quote, weird stuff. Yeah, and <laughs> it shows. <laughs> yeah, Cartoon Network, you know what? Props to Cartoon Network, honestly. Like, a cartoon miniseries? 
on a kid's pro like station. Yeah. This this was new ground for sure. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Take notes, Nickelodeon. Not every show has to be SpongeBob. Y- your wow. success is your own downfall. Anyway, side rant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but this is like a real. It's a really out there show. Aside just from its interesting production and presentation as a miniseries, like it's such a strange show. But in a good, 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 good way. I wonder if kids like it though. Uh, yeah. I don't know. I haven't asked any kids. Me neither. <laughs> but as an adult, I love it. A lot of the people I talk to who love this show are, like, my age. Yeah. I'll have to ask a child someday. What's another song? Uh, oh, oh, what's the teacher's name? Miss Langtree. Miss Langtree's Lament. Yeah, she gets a cute little song, too. Uh, unfortunately, some of these songs kind of play in the background to dialogue. Yeah. But that's what the soundtrack is for. Oh, my Jimmy left me. The whole the whole build up is great too. Like Miss Langtree, her fiance Jimmy Brown has run off to the circus for some apparent reason, and like she like waxes poetic about it. Like the she's in the schoolroom like teaching her children of animals, and like the lights dim and like you see her walk towards the window and you get those like little little like ah oh, the the dust motes yeah. through the window again. We're doing important work here, teaching animals to read and spell. Yeah, she like. Is this what I'm paying for? <laughs> this show, by the way, is also really funny. Yeah. Like, we're not really selling that aspect of it. It's actually got really good funny moments. Absolutely. Like, Miss Langtree's like, oh, oh, Jimmy Brown with you running off to the circus and that wild gorilla on the loose. <laughs> it's so out of left field. <laughs> but it's relevant. I think from the concept art, it was originally going to be like a bear on the loose, but a gorilla is just way more random. <laughs> It's much funnier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and I this show have... does like it does that well, where it mixes, you know, kind of like the more serious things with the silly humor that you know you'd expect from like a modern cartoon. Yeah, there's a mm-hmm. moment where like something bad's happening to a character, and then like they're coughing up leaves, and like, oh, geez, they're going inside him. No, I would just eat leaves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, lots of clever moments like that. <laughs> just a little bit of levity, because otherwise this show would be. It it would have a really grim feeling to it otherwise. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And again, I actually think that contrast, again, I talk about this in every episode, that contrast between, like, the humor and the lightheartedness that gets you to like the characters, and then you really feel things when they're put in actual, like, serious circumstances. It's like, no, no, but they're, they're always so happy, and, and now they have to do oh, this stuff here. Yeah, like, in the first episode alone, you get this really great moody atmosphere while Greg is going off to find the frog that he has found and is trying to name something. And he like, at one point he's calling it kitty and none of the names Mm -hmm. he has sticks for it, but he's just calling it kitty. And he's like looking for it like kitty, kitty, where'd that frog named kitty go? And like, he finds it eventually, but then like you hear something like growling coming towards them. He's like, kitty. And you see this like horrible, horrible, like huge wolf thing looking down on him with terrible, blue and yellow and red eyes and like it's so creepy and greg says you have beautiful eyes (laughs) (laughs) it's really funny but you know i i do gotta say to that it's good to have that humor balance because if this show was like or any show really was just completely you know the characters being just stepped on constantly yeah it would get exhausting and you could not get invested yeah yeah that's a criticism I've actually heard directed at shows like Attack on Titan, where it's because it's constantly terrible things, like, why would you want to get invested? That's true. I, I feel like people got fatigued with The Walking Dead over that, too. Mm-hmm. As an Attack on Titan fan, I don't know why. <laughs> uh. <laughs> why do I like watching people die episode after episode? <laughs> yeah, I also an Attack on Titan fan, but like I also get where they're coming from with that. Yeah. It can be exhausting. Like, you do have to have some levity, and I think, like, some more adult shows have problems with that. Mm-hmm. For sure. It's why BoJack works so well. Yes. Yes, yes indeed. Yep, again, we've talked about this before, and it's still relevant. Yes, li- if you want more yeah. on that, listen to our BoJack episode. I wasn't there, but it's still a good episode, probably. <laughs> Shameless plug. <laughs> yep. Uh, would the next song be the, uh, oh, the one in the bar, the, in the inn? Potatoes and Molasses. We have to talk about Potatoes and Molasses. Oh, yeah. Potatoes and Molasses. Like, Catchiest yeah. song in the show. Potatoes. 
shoes and molasses. If, if you, you want, want some more, then just ask us the warm on socks like puppies and socks. Yeah. And that's enough. <laughs> Is this what I paid for? <laughs> I love that. Uh, it's so funny. Um, yes, that is what you paid for. Let us listen to the catchy song. Darn it. Yeah, like, the whole of episode three is kind of more of a Greg episode. And, like, he he has, like, a yeah. few centered on him where he kind of has to, like, you know, be all, like, optimistic and try and find the good and help people. And he's a very sweet kid. He's a you know, sweet little wholesome boy. And he sees that they're having bland potatoes for lunch at the schoolhouse, so he decides that he's going to have Miss Langtree play a little ditty. Like, play something like this. And he, like, bangs on the piano. <laughs> oh, like this? Oh, like this? And she plays a nice little song. <laughs> Good enough. <laughs> Brief reaction there is very funny. Yeah. <laughs> and then, like, he gets a little molasses bottle, pours it on their potatoes, and they have a nice little animal crackers in my soup lunch. Hmm. Yeah, it's all, all the students are animals. And it's kind of, it, like, not anthropomorphized animals, just animals with clothes. Yeah. This show is strange. <laughs> they look like Richard Scary animals, kind of. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. But yeah, like, um, this episode is actually good at kind of like setting the tone for the characters because, you know, we have Wirt, who is kind of over serious, and then we have Greg, who is constantly trying to make the world a little bit of a brighter place and bring some joy into people's lives. Kind of setting up the antagonism between uh, Wirt and Beatrice as well. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm just a pushover. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe you're not such a pushover after all. Really? Yeah. I realize now you're a stubborn jerk. When you gotta give this up? Maybe never. Maybe I'll never give this up. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah. Wirt and Beatrice's kind of antagonism is another thing that could easily get exhausting which i think maybe the show benefits from being a miniseries in that way it doesn't overstay its welcome yeah for sure that plot thread rather not the show itself i could watch the show forever that's true <laughs> yeah the show is very condensed it's like it has a conflict and it gives you the basis of the conflict the base of the idea and then it quickly resolves it so you know it's just like just enough to give you a satisfying bite yeah a little bite um I think the next song is finally the the one at the inn. Yeah, the inn has several songs, and it's more like a oh, that's true. like a Betty Boop kind of episode where, like, you know, you have an innkeeper who looks a lot and sounds a lot like Betty Boop, and then that was totally intentional. Yes. Can we talk about the different animation styles for a second? Because, like, in Please. every single episode, it feels like they took inspiration from, like, a different era of animation, a different illustrator, mm. some kind of different classic style. Yeah. And they, like, did their own version of it. So, like, like the end episode is like Betty Boop. Again, the schoolhouse episode almost looks like Richard Scarry. Later on, there's an episode that's very, like, classic 1920s, 1930s Disney um, rubber hosey, yeah, rubber hosey, yeah. and like the dreamlike episode specifically it reminds me of Winkin and Blinkin and Nod with the, like angelic choir and like the cute chubby faces and the colors and yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Then there's another episode that is very much like almost Miyazakian, where it has like a very anime demon character and a character that looks a lot like Yubaba, and so. <laughs> Like, that is one of the things that keeps me watching this series over and over again is, like, it's almost like these unique animators decided, hey, let's take all these styles and do almost our own version of it inspired by it and bring these yeah. characters in it to tie it all together. And it's just like a giant explosion of cre creativity. Yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. Anyway, that has been my intellectual animation rant of the episode. Go ahead, Bex. We, we love them, Carrie. We love them. Um... Yeah, in this in episode in particular, there's this very brief moment of animation um, of the uh, of the highwayman. I'm the highwayman. <laughs> it's, it's probably the standout bizarre moment in what is already a very bizarre show where it's... I don't know if it was actually rotoscoped. Yeah, I don't think it was. I think it was more like in the style of rotoscoping, which makes it weirder. Like... like Fo F A U X photoscope. Yeah, you're, like you're trying to model it off someone who is uh, an art style that is modeling it off something like you know real, so it it adds that extra layer of uncanny valley. Yeah, it's it's impossible to describe, but to compare, it's kind of like the Cab Calloway segment from um, that Betty Boop cartoon. Is it Minnie the Moocher? Snow uh, Snow White. Well, no, no, yeah, it's the Betty Boop Snow White one. Yeah, yeah, where like th this uh, ghost character does this really uncanny dance and and so the highwayman and it's 
he does this dance and it's like parts of it are like very it's so hard to describe it's very very hard the model breaks in every frame yeah it's, squishes and squashes yeah, it's like, and like his arms are waving and he's leaning in and like they do lens distortion on him and it's super cool but also kind of unsettling I'm the highway man when I make ends meet. <laughs> and again very like classic 1920s 30s like jazz era back yeah. when jazz jazz is the devil that jazz music infiltrating our kids minds that jazz music trying to be Betty Boop there <laughs> he's the butcher <laughs> boop boop beep, beep. <laughs> and yeah the Betty Boop innkeeper uh or the tavern keeper is the what tavern she keeper the tavern keeper um she gets a little song too I like her song as well um yeah it's, it's about beware the beast yeah it's very much modeled after the headless horseman song from sleepy hollow yeah, this, this show does take, like, in terms of visuals, the show also does seem to take a lot from, like, 1800s Americana. Like, it has a very Sleepy Hollow, Washington Irving, like, yeah, Northeast yeah. Woods kind of vibe to it. For sure. Like, they took a lot of, like, little elements from, like, even the more obscure Washington Irving stories, because, like, who even knows most of his stories apart from Sleepy Hollow and uh, Rip Van Winkle even, maybe? I don't. Me neither, but <laughs> there's... Again, I'm a bad English major. <laughs> there's one, like, apparently a Christmas story he made where there's, like, peacocks throwing about this rich guy's mansion, and that was used for Quincy Endicott's character. Oh, I did not know that. I was wondering if there was something... Like, I was gonna say, with all the ad- different animation styles and stuff, that is the only one that I couldn't pinpoint. It was the Quincy Endicott in the mansion episode that is right after this uh, yeah. episode that we've been talking about. Yeah, but like they use a lot, the mansion for Endicott is very like French Rococo and uh, what else does Wirt you say? only know that because Wirt said it. <laughs> yeah, what French French Rococo and what else did he say? <laughs> oh no, Georgian sensibilities. That's what he said. Hmm. So that they based it off those kind of mansions and <laughs> like <laughs> there's just a funny bit with like Wirt and Beatrice that grows their characters a bit too where they're talking about who they were and were kind of confessing that he's a nerd who plays clarinet <laughs> and reads poems one thing i liked about the uh uh composer's cut is uh being able to notice like wart's uh wart's character theme his liet motif is that the word it's it's clarinet because yeah. he's a clarinet playing dork mm-hmm. i played clarinet in middle school <laughs> yeah and he and he knows like the difference between george and and Rococo like architecture yeah. and Beatrice's like who am I even talking to right now <laughs> so yeah, you got John Cleese as Quincy Endicott and the thing about this show is they actually did manage to get like the core cast together to record their lines you know together but obviously with people like John Cleese who are over in Britain they had to be recorded over the phone but you couldn't tell over this yeah cause, cause like his, his character and his dialogue is so great and John Cleese is always great I like how he, like, it makes me wonder what his direction was, because the way he reads his lines is so interesting. Well, originally it was going to be a lot more dry with Quincy Endicott, like, it was more, like, overly dramatic, like, radio drama, Mm. but John Cleese added those kind of starters, like, ha ha, maybe I'm on on, on the brink of of madness, let's go to the parlor. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, that's the line I was thinking of specifically, right? Like, how do you direct that? Yeah, Yeah, he added a lot, he added a lot to the character. I'm glad he did. Anyone want to go back to the Paula? <laughs> the horse. <laughs> oh, are we at? Are we at? Are we at the next episode yet? I suppose so. Yes, let's talk about the the see, episode six is probably what you'd call like the maybe the midpoint of the show more than episode five because like you know you got there's a lot that happens in this episode in terms of plot. There's like a shift and. No, you're probably gonna say it smarter than me. That was exactly what I was gonna say. So, so say it. The early episodes are much more about like the episodic nature, and then it's kind of like the plot kicks in, and it's more plot based after that. Um, this what's the song in this one called? Over the Garden Wall. Wow, uh, this is my favorite song in the show. Yeah, it's sung by Jack Jones, the Greg's little frog, whom he <laughs> names after the presidents and Benjamin Franklin in this episode. George Washington. <laughs> Benjamin Franklin, you've come back. <laughs> yep. Running gag in the show is work constantly changing the frog's name. Or Greg. Greg oh, yeah. sorry, Greg. 
At one point, it is named Wart, though. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Oh, this song's so tasty. It's, I don't know, it's it's mellow and romantic and... I like it, I like it. That's that's my intelligent contribution. Very calming. Hmm. Very, uh, visual. And the frogs are dancing on this riverboat and... <laughs> yeah. It's like a, it's like a chill southern riverboat Mississippi vibe. Yeah, it is yeah. like a song you'd hear on a riverboat, like just you know, as the sun sets and you see all the flies over the bog, and it's very atmospheric. For some reason, I've watched this show many times, but this is the first time I thought to make the comparison to the Frog and Toad books. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. yeah. I wonder if that was an influence at all. I wonder. <laughs> Those books are so classic because, like, yeah. I actually this is a tangent, but like. I, I was over at, like, my mom's library, and we found a little toad and frog book, and my older sister was reading a bit, like, excerpts of it from <laughs> what we remembered. And, like, a lot of those stories, like, have no real ending. <laughs> like, there's one where Toad is embarrassed to be seen in his bathing suit, or is it Frog? I don't remember. Either one. But, like, he's like, I'm worried you'll laugh at me. And then <laughs> Frog's like, we're not gonna laugh at you. And the whole, like forest comes together like oh we're not gonna laugh at you but i want to see your uh, suit i want to see your suit and he finally comes out and they laugh at him and he's like i'm leaving and that's the end <laughs> <laughs> yeah i remember reading those books as a kid good stuff <laughs> that's actually kind of funny because it sounds like some of the things that happens in this episode like word is afraid that everyone's gonna laugh at him for playing the bassoon hmm. yeah and greg is uh ashamed of his frog or forest frog because he is naked <laughs> Yeah, on a fr on a boat filled with clothed frogs, and at the end of the episode, Word is like, "I'm leaving." Oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> but that would be spoilery, so I'm not going to explain why. Ooh. Ooh. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll we'll avoid like getting into the plot too much. Um. Oh, are we at the next episode now, though? Oh, the next episode. My favorite episode. It's so creepy. Yeah, this is where we meet Auntie Whispers. Auntie Whispers. Lorna, the ringing of the bell commands you. Auntie Whispers, played by Tim Curry. Oh my god, this, this, the voice he uses is so unsettling. Yeah, it's very un-Tim Curry, because Tim Curry is known for very flamboyant voice acting and very hammy voice acting, but... Yeah, the first time I watched this episode, I saw the credits and I didn't believe it. Yeah, I think this was one of the first roles he had after a stroke, too, which yeah. might have con contributed to it, but it's... A very anti-Tim Curry performance because it's very subdued and very kind of like mellow and one note like, hmm, Lorna, has anyone come by here today? Yeah, and yeah. Oh, 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 Auntie Whispers, Auntie Whispers. This design made me want to throw up the first time I saw it. She's so scary. Yeah. <laughs> She's terrifying. Yeah. She has like this huge face, kind of like you bobbers and Eva from Spirited Away. Yeah. It also really reminds me of like in Alice in Wonderland, how the illustrations drew the Duchess character, like very big head, like very like kind of fat body, big head, huge head. Like it's uh, great. For, for me, it actually reminded me of a character from Stephen King book. I'm a Stephen King freak, listeners, just by the way. Um, there's a character in Black House, Mr. Munchin, who's this demon with this huge swollen head. And I saw that and it's like, oh, cool. <laughs> this vi this creature that actually legit scared me in a Stephen King book is now in front of me. <laughs> yeah. Very exaggerated face. Like her teeth are black, black and, and missing. Her eyes are all bulgy. See, I was like, is she chewing on something? Or are those like the black turtles that appear throughout the show in her mouth or something? Oh, maybe. <laughs> it looks like all those, uh, all that food has made her teeth go gray and her gums are all icky and ugh. But even she gets like a moment of like, hell, like, you know, laughter when <laughs> like they're trying to hide from her and she goes, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I love this character now. Like, but the first time I saw her, it was like too much. My, it just overloaded me. Yeah. And like listener, listeners, I don't want to oversell it. You're probably going to see her and think, oh, whatever. But like this just happened to hit all the right buttons for me. There's like a great moment where Greg is chasing his frogs up the stairs to uh, Auntie Whispers room and he's like, <laughs> paging Dr. Frog, you need it in the operating. He sees Auntie Whispers. <laughs> <laughs> I could do an entire podcast episode on just this 11 minute episode. Yeah, there's it's... a great twist to it, too, but that would get into spoilers. Yeah. Yep. No spoilers, but very cool episode and creepy. Yeah, creepy. Not just because of Auntie Whispers, but because of, like, the situation of, like, there's this girl in this house who's, like, doing all these chores. 
apparently for Auntie Whispers, who is like controlling her with a bell and's like, what the heck is happening? This is yeah. so messed up. I think Wurt says something to that effect. Yeah, he's like, I mean, I don't mean to get it between you and your family. She's not my real aunt. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> it's even worse. <laughs> it's so messed up. And like, thankfully, Wurt as the audience surrogate, like, you know, saying, right, what's on our minds? Yeah. But this also leads into the Beast's whole, you know, arc. Well, not arc, but, like, storyline where he's sort of been stalking the boys from the distance, and you kind of hear him singing from a distance, too, that song about chopping the wood to light the fire, which is actually inspired from uh, the Hansel and Gretel opera. Ooh. This song creeps you out, huh? It it creeps me out a lot, because, like, in the next episode, when, you know, word is starting to kind of lose hope about finding home, and they're just traveling along this cold and, like, icy-looking river... Like, you hear it in the distance, like, him doing his little tra which would be ridiculous, but, like, the way he sings it and the way the music is kind of, like, subdued and dark and quiet and, like, you think something's gonna creep up on you. It's very creepy. I don't like it. <laughs> yeah. What a good Halloween show. Yes. Yeah. An amazing fall vibe to this. Like, I love watching the show around Halloween every year. Yeah. Full show. And they do it not just with the color palette, but just with the sheer amount of detail in the background. Like, it feels like, I think they said that they took inspiration from, like, uh, classic print, classic American printings and, yeah. like, they base the illustration style. And so, you know, you kind of have the woods almost as the frame. And, Ooh. you know, it has a very, like, almost sepia tone color palette through a lot of it with... Even yeah. Word oh. and Greg, who are the two more colorful characters throughout it, they still are kind of more subdued. Yeah, and, like, g- good call on sepia-toned, but, like, not artificially. It's not like there's a filter over this show. It's just very, very smart color choices Yeah, that give it that vibe. Speaking of color choices, in, uh, in the same episode as, like, the Beast kind of stalking them, you get the Greg's dream sequence, which is again inspired from like the old twenties, thirties cartoons, like the Alice comedies and you know silly symphonies and those old merry melodies before the Looney Tunes, really. You know. Yeah, yeah. You, like you have all these, you know, like uh, noodle arm cartoon characters in bright colors, in Technicolor, glorious Technicolor. Yeah, but holding but, all the welcome signs, just like Alice. But they actually did like study those old cartoons and. To, for you know how the colors looked and such and they actually muted or didn't use yellow a lot because yellow didn't really translate very well back then oh very cool uh they do a couple shots too with like the black frame around them yeah and that shot of the dog with the rain cloud over it <laughs> okay that's enough <laughs> uh. but yeah even the very like plot beats are like an old cartoon like you have like the you know kind of nonsense at the beginning like oh this is fun but then like you open the bottle and unleash the antagonist and it's like oh no and then there's like a <laughs> song about the antagonist and then the antagonist chases the hero and then the hero stops the antagonist it's very very good old cartoon feel yeah and it's funny too um the old 20s ish like cartoons from this era creep me out listeners but they, they um, do, do for me too yeah but they um they get this they nail the style without the creepiness i find yeah yeah there was definitely kind of like the animators back then were still figuring out how to do animated movement well and they didn't always succeed so a lot of uncanny valley happened oh i used to have nightmares about betty boop talking yeah. about her again yeah like if you want like a a a feel of if, if for some reason you can't find old cartoons if you want a feel of what they were like you should play cuphead <laughs> that's true yeah cuphead Ooh, that's animated let's do an episode about it Ooh, that counts <laughs> i guess it's <laughs> <laughs> great but this show did a lot like one of the reasons why cuphead was so good is that like again they actually used the old animation techniques and copied them and this show did the same thing with the soundtrack and you know again it's like a lot of attention to detail and capturing the old styles Hmm. cartoons they put a lot of work in cartoons these days hey here's a bit of a rant for you listeners when people say uh cartoons when i was a kid in the 80s were better listen <laughs> listen you're objectively wrong <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah 
as much as you know like it's fun looking back at stuff like he-man through nostalgia goggles and looking at like early 90s cartoons like camp candy and that stuff it's like yeah it's like i liked this when i was a kid and oh things were better when i was a kid Eh, no they were mainly just commercials for toys and like cheaply made things that companies were like all right well let's put no effort into this it's just for kids who cares yeah nostalgia is a powerful thing (laughs) yeah definitely i think modern day cartoons are going to be remembered more fondly yeah they have better plots and better better characters i would say like yeah i mean the characters from old cartoons are fine like you know but there's a lot more depth to them nowadays yeah like the animation age ghetto was much more of a thing back then which we really probably should have been talking about the animation age ghetto with like bojack and some of the other quote adult shows that we've been watching there's like this notion in the west that cartoons are just for kids Hmm. and it's only recently that we're kind of finally getting cartoons that are actually taking themselves seriously and letting us have actual plots and actual characters and like have effort put into their production I've seen it said, too, that that's because it's our generation making cartoons now, and we're kind of the first generation in in the West that was raised on anime. Yeah, yeah. Quite possibly. There is a lot of anime influence in stuff like Steven Universe and Mm -hmm. even Adventure Time. Not so much in Over the Garden Wall, though, just to end this uh, tangent. (laughs) There is kind of a 80s vibe in Episode 9, though, but that goes into some spoilers. Hardcore spoilers, so we're gonna... Yeah, I think we're probably not gonna talk about the details of the last few episodes, because they're just, like, all spoilers. Yeah, Episode 10, I will say, though, from the director's commentary, they based it kind of off an opera, more so than any of the the other episodes, and you can get that in, like, the lighting and how the characters kind of, like move in relation to the lighting and it's it's very clever it's very good also we have the uh, ethereal version of potatoes and molasses uh. yeah let me cut in spoilers i'm stamping a spoiler warning here we're not going to get too into it but if you want to go in completely blind you shouldn't have listened to this podcast if you want to go in somewhat blind stop now yes. um yeah yes. just because i do want to talk about the ending a little bit but we won't get you know it too is great into it. it is a great ending it's a great ending for a great show Jason mm-hmm. Funderburker. Jason Jason Funderburker. Funderburker. <laughs> Here's the thing about Jason Funderburker. Based on the director. Yeah, he get yes, but he gets name dropped in episode six, like when Word is telling Beatrice more about like his, you know, regular his life crush. at home. Yeah. And his crush, yeah, Sarah. And he's saying, Okay, so I was gonna go talk to Sarah, you know? But then Jason Funderburger comes up and sweeps her off her feet. Jason Funderburger, <laughs> and you get this impression that Jason Funderburger is kind of this, even... this like jock guy or big guy, and like, and he even says at one point, like he's just got his act together. <laughs> <laughs> so episode nine reveals that you know, Wirt and Greg are like basically from the eighties, this like town from the eighties, and it was Halloween, and Wirt has, spends Halloween night trying to get the nerve to talk to his crush Sarah, and eventually it leads to him going to this party where Sarah is, and. He's going to, you know, talk to her and get that tape he made for her with poetry and clarinet back because he is so embarrassed that she might hear it. And then from the background, you see the true hero of the show, Jason Funderburger, walk on screen and say, <laughs> hey, Sarah, are you ready to go? <laughs> you guys, you got to see this kid. He's a disaster. He's an absolute disaster of a human being. <laughs> Sarah, do you believe in ghosts? Uh, why? Because there's one right behind you! Nah, I'm just kidding. (laughs) And we like torturing Jason because his name is Jason. Torturing? I love Jason Funderburger. Okay, okay. (laughs) That is my favorite character that has my name. Yeah, he's got these hilarious, like, tiny little eyes. Just, it's just... It doesn't match anything else in the show anymore. Yeah. Just look at this kid. And it's designed based on, like, the director's, uh, Pat McHale's, like, college photo or something, which makes it even better. Yeah, senior year photo. Oh, it's so good. It is so good. And, like, it is kind of true. He does have his life more together than words, because he's a lot more confident, even though he's kind of a nerd himself. Yeah, like, true. I call him a disaster, but I'm I'm just talking visually. He's yeah. a, he's a great, he's a champion. He is. <laughs> Power yeah. frog. <laughs> 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 and he like reaches his hand and grabs Sarah's hand, and she like completely igno- almost ignores it. 
Yeah. Oh. Wirt, Wirt is basically like that scene from Meet the Robinsons where the bad guy is talking about like his school years and it's like yeah. everyone's like, hey, that finder's cool. Want to come over to my house? They all hated me. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's true. <laughs> Oh, can we do an episode on Meet the Robinsons? I have yes. opinions. Yes, we I definitely like are. I have opinions as well. I like cool. that movie. That was like the first movie that I <laughs> saw when I was in the whole Disney Renaissance, like new Disney Renaissance thing, because it was the first one that the Pixar staff got their hands on, mm. sort of. Yeah, it threw mid-production, so it's a little rockier, but yeah, we can talk about that. Oh, oh, and the climax. Um, Yeah, the operatic kind of tone to it and the reveal of what the beast looks oh, like played... I love how they reveal the beast. Yeah, it's very fast. It's one, it's a single frame. Like, they kind of shine the lantern at him. It's just a flash of what he looks like. It's terrifying. Like, just that flash you get. It's enough to imprint in your brain in a kind of, just a what the fuck was that kind of way. Yeah. There is something kind of, I don't know how much this will date the episode, (laughs) probably a lot, but there's kind of a Slender Man kind of vibe to him, because he's like kind of a shadowy character in the trees and kind of sticks to the background where you can't really see him sometimes, but he kind of, if you squint, you can see him and it's like, ugh, creepy. And true, like, true. His shadowy design too. Can't, can't dump on that. It's also brilliant. There's an old back train a coming. You don't need no ticket. Yeah. Oh, the train, the but train yeah, that's is, been teased. Yes. The train comes in in a very good way. Like, mm-hmm. yeah. And we do find out what the link between the unknown and the real world is. Yes. And actually, the whole show was going to be set on a train, sort oh. of like an Infinity Train kind of thing. But eventually... Shameless plug, Infinity Train looks awesome. Watch it when it comes out, please. Yes, mm. yes. The, the pilot is very good. You should watch that. And, like, yeah, eventually it turned into, you know, the whole unknown area. And it, the on the train, it was a lot more explicit that this was a limbo type place, but it became yeah. a lot more muted for the better, I think. I agree. Um... Speaking of pilots, uh, Over the Garden Wall had a pilot. Yes. Tome of the Unknown. Tome of the Unknown, which was shown at a film festival, I do believe. Yes. Yeah. And it was pretty similar to what the show, like, ended up being. Uh, I would say they definitely took ideas from Tome of the Unknown and adapted them into the uh, uh, Hard Times at the Huskin Bee episode. Yeah, yeah. Like, vegetable people and, like, very kind of, like, very slow... What what genre would that song be? Jazz? Um, I'm so bad with music. Yeah, me too. I think that's kind of like that's kind of like more like a classic folk song. Like yeah, yeah, almost like folk. turkey like a turkey in the straw is the first thing that I think of. Yes. Ooh. You know, like that kind of uh classic hoedown type song almost. Well, not not with not with the same like upbeat thing, but just in terms of the instruments used. Like a lot of fiddle and uh Yeah, yeah. Also, I forgot to mention this when we were talking about the pumpkin episode, but the pumpkin lord is named Enoch, which mm-hmm. is Yuck. interesting because there is actually, like, in the Bible, a short verse about the Enoch who was caught up into heaven and walked with God. And there was even, like, an entire book of Enoch, which is basically this guy Enoch being taken on a tour of, like, the heavens and earth. And so it's kind of almost like the Inferno. Um, so... Mm. You know, more connections, so... And Enoch yeah. is a character in one of my favorite video games, Off, and his head is really round like a pumpkin. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's my but, contribution. <laughs> Tome of the Unknown is on the DVD, the full yeah. pilot. Watch it. Mm-hmm. But yeah, there are a lot of subtle hints that this is kind of like, not necessarily the afterlife, but kind of like limbo between... Mm-hmm. You know, and we see the characters fall into this frozen lake and, you know, it, that's what I take from it is like, it's kind of like if Wirt loses hope and succumbs to the unknown and would wander forever, that it kind of be like, well, their life is over versus, you know, they have to find the strength to go back and keep living. Yeah, for sure. You know what? I actually having a thought right now uh, in regards to like the Edelwood trees. Edelwood. It's when they give up that they start becoming trees. So maybe it's not a connection, a biblical connection. Is it biblical? The the Inferno connection to, like, yeah. suicides, but just mm-hmm. those who give up become part of the unknown. Because it makes you wonder, too, is everyone else in the unknown in the same boat as Wirt and Greg? Yeah, you do actually maybe. see Quincy Endicott's gravestone in the, you know, graveyard that 
Wirt and Greg visit in the real world. Hmm. Ah. So it makes you think. Something to think on. And also, back to the pumpkin episode, like, they say, you're not ready yet. And yeah. And then, at the end of the episode, it's like, you'll be back eventually. Mm-hmm. Yes, you'll join us someday. Yeah. Yeah. So, I don't know. I wonder. You know, I wonder, too, maybe the, uh, pots field, the- because a, po- a pots field is where the pumpkin people live, and a potter's field is, like- Unmarked graves. Unmarked graves, a graveyard of unmarked- of unknown people. Huh. I wonder if pots field is kind of, like, people who have accepted their fate- Versus Edelwood trees are people who kind of didn't go as peacefully. Maybe. Hmm. Maybe. Edelwood, Edelwood, every morning. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, did we miss any songs or anything we want to talk about? Any other little moments? I mean, there's the kind of tavern song that the co- not the cobbler, uh, the toy maker sings about. <laughs> Wirt being the lover and having a wedding like, Hi, diggity um dum today. What a merry time while I'm upon your wedding day. I need diddly umpty umpty day. There's work for all when little boys get married. <laughs> so many catchy songs. <laughs> this show is creepy and funny, but it's also really cute. This yeah. show's a lot of things. Um, You're a traveler on a sacred journey. The pilgrim. Pilgrim. Yeah, do we have any final thoughts? My Final thoughts? Go ahead. My final thought is that this is my favorite thing that Cartoon Network has ever done. Ooh, that's a that's a big statement. Bold statement indeed. I love it. And I love it when I watch it every year and it's great and it's only 10 episodes. I kind of wish there was more, but like it ends on that sweet kind of you have just enough to sustain you for repeat viewings. There are comics. Yes, there are comics. There is one that's going to be released next month that takes place after the show. Whoa. Yes, and I need to check those out. Yeah. Um, my thoughts, uh, fantastic show. Can't recommend it enough. It's so good. So good for all the reasons we said. Yeah. So we all pretty strong recommendation on this one. So, uh, thank you for listening. Our fine, fine listeners who need a nickname. I'm going to think of something for you. Lovelies. We can't use lovelies. Um, nerds, you cool babies. What's up, you cool babies? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I am Becca McGraw. I'm a digital artist, uh, sometimes animator, wink, wonk. Uh, you can find all my stuff at RebeccaSersis.com. I am Carrie Dreblo, YouTube's animation critic. You can find me at Animation Critic, all one word, on YouTube. I'm Jason Knott. You can find some of my reviews on whatever reviews on Blogger.com. I've actually reviewed Over the Garden Wall. It's four years old, but it's all my thoughts <laughs> collected in one oh. place. <laughs> Oh, the show is much sweeter than algebra class if your stomach is grumbling and your mouth starts mumbling. Mitch, There's play us out! That's shin of... Grumbling or potato. actually start at the start with that theme song ah uh, yes I, into the unknown ow, ow, i love ow, that theme ow, song ow, it's ow, so ow. It, are, are you dying i Jason? think i have a charlie horse or something oh man oh ow, 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 ow. that hurt push push your leg against the wall Ooh. put your foot against the wall and push Ooh. it Ooh, ow, 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 ow. Ah, how did that happen wind beckons through the trees as there is a horse in this cartoon <laughs> His name's not Charlie, though. <laughs> nice to horse your acquaintance. Sorry, this is all going to get cut. <laughs> I don't know how that happened. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Um, I'll have to ask a child someday. I go up to a random child. Hey, you. You. Hey, get away from your parents. Talk to me about <laughs> Over the Garden Wall. <laughs> I actually did. <laughs> it's fine. I did that back in college because, like, my mailroom instructor had a kid who was a Disney fan. And so, like, I would actually ask, what did you think about this movie? What did you think about this movie? And the kid was actually <laughs> like, why do you want to know? Reason. <laughs> You'll understand when you're also 20. <laughs> I thought Home on the Range was great. <laughs> okay, shut up, kids. Your opinion is invalid now. <laughs> Get out of here. Uh, okay, but back to Over the Garden Wall. Yes, Over the Garden Wall. But what about our side topics? We have to ramble off topic at least once per episode. <laughs> we have to be nice to our editor. Um... <laughs>
This would not be an episode of Destination Animation if we didn't talk about, hey, we should do an episode on this thing. We shall. We should write these down, though, because <laughs> I don't remember any of the ones we've said before. Yes. Um, watch Krampus, though. Krampus is great. We can talk about Krampus. We could probably talk about Krampus. Oh, I haven't seen that. It's not animated, but it uses, like, uh, practical effects. Yeah, a majority of practical effects. I've been trying to justify a reason for us to review Krampus. This isn't... Bite, you can cut this all out, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Teaser for Krampus. We'll talk about it after. Yeah, but that reveal of what he looks like is way scarier than anything in the Slenderman movie that came out this year. <laughs> <laughs> uh, That's the only reason I made that comparison. Hey, this is an animation podcast, friends, listeners. But don't watch Slenderman. <laughs> but yeah, don't watch Slenderman. It's so bad. It's terrible. Ugh. There is a debate now, like, where do you blur the line between CGI animation mo as a movie and just a live action movie with, like, 80% of it being CG? We can find that seriously, out. seriously, like, most live action, a lot of live action movies now are more animated than they are live yeah. action. We'll find that out when The Lion King comes out. Yeah. That, yeah, let's actually save this topic for The Lion King. That's a good call. Yes. Sorry, Bite, we went off on a 50-hour tangent. Where are we? <laughs> It'll make the episode shorter, at least. Uh, yeah, we'll what, come the, up talking about the so talking about the climax still. Right. Um, you guys say smart things. I need another pee break. I'm so sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, make brain smart making. Smart brain king illegal forest. But 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 Leela need brain for smart making. <laughs> Ugh, I'm tired. Watch this show. The ringing of the bell commands you. Hmm. Uh, I, I don't have a bell. I don't have a bell. I have my teacup, though. <laughs> well, that's, oh, that's go. going into get out hypnotism. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, yeah, let's do that. Um, <laughs> yeah. Watch now this now you're in the unknown place. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um.